Morning all. Uh, there's an elephant in the room right now in the world of chess because there's a cheating scandal in Zadar. And I've just seen uh, quite a comprehensive long video by FIDE master Valery Lilov, who's about 2400 FIDE. Um, uh, one, one thing about it, he used Houdini free uh, when looking over the games. Um, and someone, someone's mentioned on the channel for me to check out the games. And I'll add a Kambitzer and 2.0b, uh, which I think is actually the engine uh, which, um, if there was cheating, um, it's the engine which has the highest cor correlation. Um, I'm not saying anything for certain, but just have a look at this game in round one. Uh, Ivanov Borislav playing white against the 24-26, so he's 22-27. Uh, so there's a, quite a bit of rating gap, but um, he's playing white. And okay, d4. All this is opening theory, which we have to sort of disregard as, as far as engine matching. But um, okay, so e5, and it's a mistake um, sometimes to play d takes e in, in terms of reducing uh, the tension. This is this is not in the um, computer spirit, and it's thinking that d takes e5 is is quite a good move here, but. Um, it's it, it's reducing the tension in the position, and it's not considered such a great move. But computers kind of like it, especially when there's an opportunity to win material, and so it's actually considered here. Uh, my my assessment of this line many years back was that black was getting good compensation, and in overboard I was winning with black with this gambit. Black is playing with this uh, system here. This, this is mainline King's engine, a gambit in effect, but usually players with white will not go into the gambit because experience kind of dictates that you're kind of increasing the scope of this bishop on on the diagonal. And black is, is getting lots of active counterplay, which as humans, we want lots of play. But the computer is just seeing a way to win a pawn here. And you, you'll see, I hope you can see, if I just move this up a little bit, you'll see at least the top two choices clearly. Um, okay, I think you should should be able to see it in the recording area the top two choices and D takes e5 is very uh, attractive, but it could, it could just be you know a anyone can play that any human can also choose to play this line uh, to infuriate a king's engine player and to cheekily win the pawn and try and get black to sort of I mean it has been played a lot as well by humans so again there's no there's no clear evidence but in, in if the computer ha if computer was used and it was out of opening book it would be also a very tempting line d takes e5 uh so a lot of pressure is being put on black to avoid material loss in fact black is losing material uh he plays c6 and it's a standard way of gambiting here knight takes e5 Rook e8, and this is all kind of, it looks theory as well, that this, this is playable for white for a small advantage, but it's not a pop, it's not that popular a system. Uh, you might wonder what, what is going on here? Well, there's a back row, um, tactic here. Check, and actually bishop takes f6, and so that's how white is not losing a piece here. So, uh, knight a6, Okay, now here it gets you know very very technical. If White has got an advantage, uh, and this is very interesting because this is a forcing sequence for Black to have this position, and um, a lot of King's Engine players would be happy with Black's position here. But this is a nice technical technical move, and I don't want to sort of say with with hundred percent certainty or anything. I want to let you sort of judge just the technical accuracy of of Borislav's play. Uh, even off Borislav's play, Rook D6 is a technically accurate move, putting pressure on F6, and also maybe inhibiting B5 later from Black. Okay, so in this position, uh, we can just take on F6. Now the Knight is not retreating back, so if Rook takes, we can just take on F6, and White still got a got an advantage and materially up. So Black plays Bishop E6, so he's really a pawn down, playing a gambit now. Uh, so, uh, white is is technically got this this advantage uh, from the material, but black has active play, and you can think this bishop's going to be potentially dangerous. But at the moment, um, the, the soft spots of white are on this diagonal, e5 and c3, 
and you notice now okay white's e4 is also on the fire it supports that um you'll see top move i don't know if i should say top move but um top move again okay uh white taking on d7 top move but there's a, there's an issue now raised the soft spot on c3 and that's compensated very well with king c2 now actually he, uh, <laughs> when i was going through uh lilov's video um i just thought hang on this 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 opening um seems actually very good if if white can get this position of pawn up why why don't we play this <laughs> this way i mean i think there's going to be in an influence of of computers on our own style of chess and maybe more people are going to play this line and if that happens the distinction between being able to tell between humans and computers is going to be even more difficult in, in as far as opening choices anyway concerned but later you know where, where there's astronomical number of possibilities uh, you you would find it maybe harder to imagine um, uh, a top move correlation all the time uh, so here b3 okay sort of prophylaxis uh, well, not prophylaxis. Pardon me. B3 is enabled by the fact that the king has moved here, supporting C3. Otherwise, that that would have been a soft spot. He's, he's defending C4 now. Uh, in this position, hold on a sec. Why wasn't bishop takes C4? It wasn't on because of rook takes D7. So, pardon me. So black is actually threatening bishop C4. So king C2, B3. So white is actually, believe it or not, a solid pawn up, and black can't even contest the D8 square. So what a nice opening to play for, for white so far. Uh, black tries to generate more counter play with g5, trying to get maybe the e5 square. Uh, bishop g3, keeping control of e5. Now knight g6, increasing the dark square grip. It's a nice human play from black, but technically, you know, black is a pawn down, and the diagonal soft spots have been neutralized. Is that e5 square is a bit of a concern with what you normally think of as a juicy knight, on e5 but uh, rook hd1 continuing uh, to dominate that d file and now a weakening move from black and it goes really pear-shaped black's position after f5 uh, he has weakened this diagonal and technical move so bishop h5 and you might think there might be absolutely nothing uh, convincing for you even though these are top move choices you might think these are all natural moves from white uh, okay, attacking the rook. The rook goes back to d2. An actual move, you might think. But now here, things get an another use of, of the diagonal bishop c5. And we, we did see um, when, I think, most recent game like this with bishops attacking rooks was Karpov Kasparov, a world championship match. Uh, but here, it's all stemming from f5. Black's, black's um, being kicked around. The rooks have been kicked around tactically. But here, another nice technical precision move. And up until this point, you, you might seriously think that all, all of White's moves uh, are natural and, and logical. But maybe, hold on a sec, you might think, well, hold on, can Black not take here to win e4? Um, let's, let's just check out why, for example, Bishop c3 is, is not on uh, the cards. So maybe the strongest is e takes f5, which makes rook f2 even cleverer, because if takes, is f takes e4 even on? Rook f6, okay, there's a problem with, with f7 here. Um, and it means, means rook f2 has got some real clout to it in this position to play rook f2. Uh, black plays f takes e4, and knight takes e4, and you might think, yeah, all completely natural moves. But this is another thing. It's not enough to have one one game uh, to to have this more more than any suspicion of someone making use of an engine. You need uh, more and more games get, give you a, a greater uh, number of samples to base uh, any conclusions on and reduce bias. Uh, for example, one game might have a lot of forcing sequences, and 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 it's possible that even in your own games you've had a game with very high correlation on one particular game because it was a lot of forcing sequences and, and, and a quick mate or something giving you near 100% correlation to an engine but here it's not entirely all like uh, the most obvious moves I mean I, it, it just it just seems to be that that white is hitting on Houdini 2 here the top move choices in this particular 
gain and is reaching now plus five against the two four two six opponent. And now th this is also quite clever giving up the exchange to make use of, of this uh, pin with rook f8. So he's giving up the exchange tactically uh, seeing um, he's going to sort of lose the rook on e1 but this tactic now is absolutely crushing cracking this pin and yeah it's it's kind of an instructive game which uh, you know Tao would be ha perhaps uh, proud of. It's, it's an absolute uh, massacre of a 2-4-2-6 and we, we saw in this game uh, if we just review that again that it was all the moves seem to be hitting uh, the top move choice but the, the kind of greedy choice of, of opening here uh, is, is kind of typical materialism you get usually from traditional um, engines this this choice of opening with d takes e5 really kind of being cynical about um, uh, black gambiting just the computer is looking at the material and thinking well you know why not and the computers are great at neutralizing of course the counterplay and we saw the soft spots all being perfectly neutralized by white and the e5 pyrotechnic well this is theory I think this position anyway but um, statistically actually if I ch check on reference um, there's a lot of games in this variation 691 this is this is all theory this 322 more than 430 now on knight b a6 this is all theory uh, so far but uh, rook d6 how many people have played rook d6 178 caution has even played this move before so even this move is free okay f4 top move okay if ef3 okay this is all all theory so far so rule all of this out uh, now we, we get less games and apparently here is where bishop f2 has been played nine times before and I can't see on my database here that the move bishop g3 okay yes that sorry bishop g3 hasn't uh, being played uh, before is there actually a problem g4 is the problem with bishop g3 apparently because e4 yeah so you play bishop f2 here to attack that knight not to give time for black uh, for g4 okay so white's still um, okay here let's let's go back pardon me so bishop h4 actually black played knight fd7 uh, so black is the one that varied pardon me didn't play g5 here um, knight fd7 there's nine games with knight f6 h7 nine games with g5 so this is a little bit unusual uh, according to my data means to play knight f6 to d7 even though the engine actually likes that move as well but um, there could be a problem here because white is taking on d7 and just neutralizing the impacts of this bishop on the diagonal. So really, what is black showing for the gambit here? The problem is that c4 can be consolidated. Black can't take on c4 without losing d7. So this is giving white almost the, the pawn is actually emerging as a clear pawn up. Black's gambit has gone is is starting to go rather slightly wrong but black is aiming uh, to at least try and get pressure on e5 use that e5 square with with g5 but you see all of white's moves are are hitting uh the top choice here <laughs> of an engine bishop e3 okay okay bishop e3 and not bishop g3 slight change here now bishop e3 pardon me bishop e3 is the top choice and was played uh, so there does seem to be a distinctive correlation and the problem here I have in, in making any evidential conclusion after rook hd1 uh, is that the top choice by the way rook hd1 no I don't know what happened there so rook hd1 put another move in here or reduce the move let's, let's just go back bishop e3 knight e5 rook hd1 is mentioned here at depth 17 
Um, <clears throat> okay, it's it's up there, and it's it's one of the moves. Okay, Rook H D one. It's up there, and it was actually played. Okay, now when Black played F five, the problem now is that there are tactical vulnerabilities to actually attack. There are uh, transitional forcing moves now available to White, which. Um, which which you could argue well well humans can also find forcing moves and that's what we should prioritize on so I would say uh, the verdict is out on this game even though black was crushed you you can't categorically say um, from just one game uh, that there's any evidence of cheating now I'm of course uh, extremely cautious uh, of from based on previous experience of moaning about um, things, events, games that I found suspects on the ICC. So I'm going to be extremely cautious about anything I say here categorically. It just looks as though there's an interesting correlation in this particular game uh, with White and Houdini's 2.0 two top moves. So, and it just results in Black getting absolutely massacred at the end with Knight F6 here. Is actually, if you look at this, he's getting kind of in a mating net now with these two bishops controlling uh, all the squares and rook h8 being threatened so it's actually uh, in in many respects it's an impressive game if you want to make use of forcing sequences uh, out of the opening against the king's engine i mean maybe we should all be playing this line uh, you know after after castling um here uh just to take and and put pressure on e5 and potential it's it is it is a it is actually a popular line though quite quite a popular line on the reference database there there are uh a thousand and six uh games here so um you know we we can play this as humans so again it's only one game so let's let's go on <clears throat> To the next game. Okay, now in round two, he actually lost after 118 moves, um, which was interesting. If we go to the the critical uh, moments, uh, there was this end game at about move 114, where if we flip the board, so Bishop d6 was played, and it was. There's a threat from white for knight f4, that is the threat, to win d5. So black should really try and defend that d5. With this, unfortunately, it's completely winning for white because of Zugzwang. That um, after taking here, black's in Zugzwang. So king e6, king g5. The king is actually being uh, driven away here. If we play here, king f5, it's Zugzwang. So there was actually a blunder, yeah. It's going to be Zugzwang here. All the pawns are dropping off, so that that was a huge blunder here um, at at this point of the game. So you know he didn't actually lose in round two, playing the move bishop d6, which is interesting. Okay, so certainly you think, well, this guy lost. Um, you know, what, why why is there evidence that he he cheated at all in this tournament? Why why is there this cheating scandal? You might ask. Um, so his opponent two five eight three just he had a uh, a solid opening. If we just quickly just go through the game, and um, it was a kind of closed position as as FM Valery Lilov uh, was indicating, where it's difficult with especially the exchange of rooks for Black to try and win uh, from this kind of position, and especially if the queens come off, we just have this end game which. Um, it's just difficult for, to win, really. Uh, not much tactics, and computers do excel uh, tactically. If there's not much going on, and a lot of repetition, and it just carried on and on and on, like this. Okay, it got a bit closed here, but with d5 as a long-term liability to look after, uh, which was made worse. It must be at some point it was made worse that d5 pawn. Uh, so when was that? Was it after? The light square bishop exchange somehow was implemented by white after this long grinding session. Light square bishop exchange k 
occurring somewhere. Ah, oh, here. So here, bishop f, bishop c8 check had been played. Uh, and then more maneuvering, and we reached that blunder position. So, so that was round two. Okay, so not so impressive losing there. Uh, now here is here is another impressive one though. His opponent, Grandmaster Bojan Krajica, two five six five. So, Ivanov Borislav playing white against the two five six five. Uh, let's have a look at this and check for correlation with move one choices. So Nimzo Indian. Uh, no, Queen's engine now. Okay, Bishop D2. Yes, okay, we're in opening book anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. Now, Bishop takes uh, B4. Bishop G2. We're in opening book anyway for a moment. Knight F3. Okay, White Castles. Okay, now we see the move A3. And okay it it looks counterintuitive to get rid of uh double pawns, but sometimes that is the case you you want to translate the opponent's um blatantly obvious uh, superficial weaknesses into more exploitable weaknesses in this case you know dynamic pressure on the a file now I'm, I might have a slightly different style of chess than than very little of to say these comments, but you know I think a three could be um just intuitively justified as well by a tactical dynamic player. Who who wants to just transition uh, weaknesses in, into more exploitable weaknesses? That you could you could play the move a three. We've had lots of historic examples. Uh, the most famous being Lasker beating Capablanca, where uh, Lasker undoubled you know Capablanca's pawns, and one after that was in the Royal Lopez exchange variation. But sometimes undoubling the opponent's pawns is the way to go forward. So we can't categorically say this is a computer move. A dynamic aggressive player might consider it as a way of getting rid of you know more visible double pawns for dynamic pressure. It's just a swap really and that's based on you know personal style. That if you're a more dynamic player you might consider such things. Okay, so A3 uh, was played. If we do a reference check I wonder what theory kind of indicates it. Theory indicates here well 12 times it's been played before. A3 it's the top move in this position. It's, it's actually we can call that standard then in this position. 27 games found here. A3 has been played by Milton Federitz, Lalic, uh, who's actually playing in this tournament by the way, uh, Bogdan Lalic. Uh, so A3 unless it was Peter Lalic. Uh, so A3 is is a popular move here to undouble the pawns. It's not really a computer move. It's all it's it's like it looks pretty standard in fact. So B6 so there's nothing really uh, that suspect at the moment. D5 you might think is a little bit controversial because of weakening uh, the C5 square. But what does white get in return? You know, dynamically, uh, white is able to get the D4 square and put pressure on on E6, fixing down D6, which could be a target. So that move, I mean, might even be still in a reference check here. Uh, of my database. No, I think we're out of we're out of reference, are we? No, being played before is actually rook f e one, knight e one. Okay, d five has been played once before as well, so that has been played before. Okay, uh, who's played that before? Pritchett is quite a decent player against Armels in nineteen eighty eight. It's played d five before, so it's not entirely you know, it's it's so e five. It's not entirely outrageous. Knight h four. Now this this is quite a dynamic tactical plan, but f5 you want to create weaknesses in black. So getting a knight to f5, Spar's favourite place for a knight. It it's all perfectly. Um, it looks all perfectly smooth and and logical. And this is this is the problem we have in the future. If we, you know to provide to provide evidence that someone's cheating, you really need um, a large number of game samples for sure. Uh, it's been an issue. On, on online servers that they need, you know, the game samples reduce bias. It's a basic research method. You can say all of White's moves, okay, it are kind of logical here. Now, Queen Queen H6 though is intriguing uh, tactically. It is is the top choice here, but how many of us would would play Queen H6? Well, actually, you might think, well, I'm just going to mate Black like this on H7. 
but um, you know, Black's always got the F pawn to defend H7. But there's there's another idea behind H6 that's actually attacking simultaneously D6 as well. So it makes Knight B5 potentially more effective. We should also be attacking A7. So Queen H6 is is a nice tactical move. In in fact, so F5 defending H7. E4 is now putting a lot of pressure tactically on this knight now, you know, taking and taking on h5 potentially. We see knight g7 to try and safeguard that. But white's really wrenching out an advantage now with e takes and now knight b5, justifying the queen, forcing uh, black to contort, uh, going into a pin, a nasty pin here with having to play rook f6, this nasty pin now. So now uh, threaten is knight takes f5. We do threat analysis. Knight takes f5 is now the threat, which black has to parry, um, as well as a7 is is on. So black parries queen f7, but white is forcibly winning material. Plays actually the move rook takes a7. Interestingly, knight takes a7 is actually the cho choice at the moment, but. Depending on how long the opponent's thinking, you might you might argue, well, it's going to come up with rook takes a7 maybe later if there was more time. If this was, uh, if there was cheating going on, is rook takes a7 uh, going to be uh, chosen over knight takes a7? This is quite interesting. Death 18. Um, we have this small ch small difference in evaluation between knight takes a7 and rook takes a7. I do wonder if we left it longer if it changes to rook takes a7. At the moment, no. Okay, so there's some doubt here, you know, but it really depends. We don't know the, the actual timings or whatever. So, okay, so rook takes a7 is up there anyway. Second, second choice here at depth 19. So that was played. So white's one material by force from a 2-5. Six five opponent. Okay, after f four we see the move rook a one, and that's popped up now. Rook a one. Uh, not any other moves which you might you might think are reasonable, like um, maybe bishop e four to use the e four square. But rook a one has got some maybe tactical venom uh, behind it that we're about to witness. Uh, so knight a6 was played, and we see knight c6. So already it's supporting the idea that um, th this this knight's loose now, so making knight c6 possible, which makes knight e7 in some variations uh, become an important forcing move, as we're about to see, rather spectacularly now. Now I think this is a really really difficult move to find, uh, but probably a very very easy move for an engine to find. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you can guess it if I give you uh, 10 seconds starting from now. Well, sorry, you can see it here, <laughs> so you don't need to guess. Pardon me. I think the guessing game is spoiled by this analysis. Knight f5. So it's actually defended in, in theory by one, two, you know, all the pieces are piled up on f5. So what what is going on uh, here? If if rook takes f5 was played, what what is going on? Um, it's not knight e7 check. Uh, well, that's not the strongest, but queen d8 is even stronger. Then uh, taking on c8 with the queen here, temporary queen sack. And in this position, it's it's pretty bad for black. So this is a real crunching move, knight f5. It's quite uh, a crunch. It's really kind of justified all of White's previous play. The Queen H6, uh, creating the weaknesses. The A files all justified. It all fits together perfectly, uh, like a jigsaw. All of White's play in this position, if you, if you think about it, because that enabled Knight C6, which enabled the Knight E7 tactics. Both knights are working together on both sides of the board. Uh, so Bishop takes F5, and we see Rook takes A6, Queen H4, Rook takes B6. You can see for yourself that it's often the first move choice. Nice uh, deflection away from defecting, uh, protecting the rook to play rook b7. So king safety is a little bit more 
uh, damaged because the queen and knight are now next to the king. The queen's been taken away from the defence here. E3, so white takes. Black's trying for some counterplay with this pawn, but uh, it might be bad for the king's safety here. The queen F8, the mate threat now has emerged. Queen G8. <laughs> Black's been prompted to sack the queen. Uh, so check, check. And bishop e4, force mate in three. You might think that's all coincidental. You might think it's all coincidental. Um, White's moves here. So this is Houdini 2.0. Just to recap, on my poxy machine here, it does seem to have uh, quite a high correlation with move one choices. But I just want to qualify what you know what um, FM Lilov said. A3 is is theory. It's it's been played before. Um, it might be counterintuitive to a lot of, uh, especially positional players, to want to leave structural weaknesses like uh, double pawns. But it is it has been played before by by strong players. Um, so a three, um, Federitz has played it uh, in twenty five thirty US GM to Federitz in nineteen ninety two. Uh, Lalich has played it in two thousand and six against the two six six five. It's been played before. Uh, that move, okay, but uh, it was it was after we we see here another glorious instruct. Instru sorry, that's I'm following a, a reference game there. Another another glorious instructive game though that White can play like this, and with d5, although he's weakening, although weakening c5, we get a very dynamic view now being uh, emerging here that it's actually Black's dark square weaknesses later. That are picked on g7, d6, and a7. There's a kind of uh, sadistic aesthetic to this that uh, that all of these are kind of weaknesses being being uh, exploited technically from White's moves. Uh, so knight b5 tapping into a7 and d6 at the same time. Um, yeah. So if nothing else, when when investigating these. Uh, Computer cheating cases. We do get, uh, as a side effect, as we, as we know from, from this channel, we do get these very interesting games to look at anyway, which kind of you you consider the moves either smooth and, and logical, kind of rule breaking. Um, and it's interesting the, the style. You know, if a positional players might might be more outraged by a three, more dynamic players might think, well, so what? Uh, you know, swapping swapping double pawns for more exploitable weaknesses. But here, yeah. White is is um, doing really uh, well now, and not worried about Black even you know creating this past pawn here, uh, because the attack's so quick uh, with Rook B7, um, it's it's just uh, it's it's not very pleasant at all. If Queen takes B7 wasn't played for those interested, Rook B8 here. The Knight's actually supporting Rook B8, uh, so here Knight E8. Check. Check. It's all crumbling, really. Just take the knight here, and there's no problem. So this this is really kind of a diabolical uh, position, where the knight and queen are coordinating. If you try and defend here, is it too little, too late? Check. Check. Click on d6. It's it's a huge position. So anyway, black decided to get mated instead by playing. E3. There's a um, it's just king safety is being shot to pieces, being threatened with mate. Goes straight into a forced mate. No defense here. Okay, so I'm um, honestly, you might not be convinced at all by anything that you've seen so far, and I completely uh, respect that. Uh, you need a lot of game samples to prove anything uh, against potential um, en engine user. Uh, so Davarin actually drew in round four with Ivanov with the white pieces. So how on earth then, if someone's using a computer, did someone uh, manage to draw? Well, the opening was actually uh, with the exchange of queens, which probably helped. Um, F5, I think it's just it's, it looks theoretical to weaken uh, the D5 square. I can't imagine. Um, I think very little of indicating as if this wouldn't be played by human but no I think it just weakens d5 in it it's been played 34 times before Kasparov has played the move f5 it looks like a very theoretical move 
Uh, Kasparov, Krasenkov, Ganguly has played this before. Kasparov played this move. When did Kasparov play this move? Uh, so on my reference check, uh, Kasparov has played this move in 1988 against Yusupov. When Yusupov was 26-15, Kasparov was 27-60. So, uh, just, sorry, just to make this clear, Ivanov was playing black. Let's flip the board. Ivanov was playing black and played the move f5. Uh, so, okay, so we see the move h6 here. Now, is that a reference move? It's been played three times before h6. More common is bishop e6. Okay. Now we see bishop e6. Black taking. Castling. Rook a d8. It looks like a perfectly natural move. It's, it's the backward pawn in the semi open file. Got to protect b7. Now, perfectly natural move. And the only thing you might think, well, e6. If e6, I think we just put the. Do we put the rook? No, we just play rook d6 attacking that one. We don't try and defend b7. Okay, so rook b6. e6 is now played, stopping white from playing e6. And it looks as though uh, black's moves. Here, rook e7. Ah, ah. Rook e7 is not mentioned. Interesting. On this depth, anyway. Depth, oh, now it is. No, it is. No, it's not. Rook e7 was the move played. And it's not mentioned here. And these moves look all equal zero anyway. Rook e7 apparently is not as good as as these. Well, on this on this depth. Okay, so that's interesting. So we haven't even got uh, a major correlation here. Now we've got rook c7, rook cd7. So these are not correlating on this depth. Okay. Now in this position, you might think, why doesn't Black take on d4? He doesn't want to like maybe lose. Um, it's equal anyway. Lose b7 at the end of that. Um, well, actually, Black did take on d4, going into this uh, very more simplified position. It was also e6. Taking on e6 is better than taking on b7, because then e5 would drop. So e6 is actually the pawn to take. Okay, so here. This ending position now e5 is swapped for b7, and here okay we see the move rook g4, and the rook's almost getting trapped if it wasn't for h5 as a kind of move to to get the rook out of prison here. Um, in this position, the 25-6-1. I don't know if he got freaked out. Technically, he's he's got a small advantage, maybe. He didn't like the look of Black's play or something. He got freaked out or something. But um, to draw over twenty-two two seven, you might think, well, why didn't he um, play on here? If he if if it looks as though uh, at the moment he's one pawn up. But um, let's see. Maybe he just thought this this was a drawn ending. Knight c four. Maybe he just thought this wasn't enough, even though there's an extra pawn over here. So he perhaps you could argue it's generous that you know someone like 300 points below he he, he doesn't mind just accepting a draw here. Okay, so again you might not think this is at all uh, spectacular so far, um, and you know I'm let's let's say I'm with you and and in fact the only move which raises any eyebrows so far in any of the games we've seen. Was the move knight f5? Let's just leave it like that for the moment. That the move knight f5 in in one of the previous games was was an eyebrow raising move. Now let's have a look at this game. So Zelkick, Robert Zelkick, 2560 is playing black against uh, Ivanov in in round five. Okay, now I think this is another fun one. So d4, we see the Trompovsky being reeled reeled out. So diverse openings. Okay, f3. Okay, this is all kind of being played before, I think. So b3, I think that's the most popular move in this position, is it? b3, okay. e4, it's all being played before. Bishop c4. Here, okay, so we see the move knight e2. That's the move which has been played before. In my deck, it makes Pushman against Zabo in 1997. Pushman actually won. 
it's a 2280 against 2320. Um, not Lazarus Sharbo, but some other Zabo. So um, Knight H5, Bishop E3. Okay, okay, no eyebrow raising just yet. Knight D2. Knight E7 now B4 using that pin seems logical. Rook E1. Black took and played Knight E5. Rook C1. Now move G3. Not minding creating some some weaknesses here. F4 is played now. Knight takes F4. Okay, Black now sacrifices the exchange uh, to get some compensation or so he fought. Knight takes c4. Unfortunately this, this isn't the right move. Black should apparently take here. Uh, still leaving white with, with an advantage um, but that's what black apparently should have should have done. Gone for this position uh, which doesn't look Entirely appetizing to have these these pawns like this, but um, instead Black played the move Knight takes c4, and we get this kind of killer check. So King f7 now, Queen e2. Uh, what is actually the threat here? Rook takes c4 is the major threat it seems. So, and can Black play b5? He does play b5, but White takes anyway. And what we have here is the Rook versus. A two bishop scenario where this queen, this bishop's kind of pinned, and there's a problem now with I think rook takes and queen e6 tactically for c8 being vulnerable. So black plays check, but this doesn't help because we've got an almighty pin here against the poor rook on a8. So king h1, bishop d7, losing that rook for not much. White's just mopping up. So did White actually play anything entirely uh, spectacular in this game? Here in this position Black resigned. What is the actual threat? Queen g6 followed by Rook e1 uh, is mating here. Okay so Black is having to sacrifice the Queen <laughs> to stave off with Queen e2. Let's run that through again. What was there that was entirely uh, spectacular? If you think there was a spectacular move, or you don't, I think there was a spectacular move. But Black was 2560, so usually statistically a 2227 will not uh, beat a 2560, perhaps like this, you could argue. And it's, it's, it's the sample size which we need to uh, use if we're going to have suspicion. It's, it's being able to do it repetitively against players. 300 points or more higher to be able to do it repetitively game after game uh, to get mating nets etc so at this at this point in the game black didn't seem to be doing that badly um, okay he hasn't got these pieces developed and we see uh, this this move bishop h4 which again is isn't apparently it's 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 an interesting move uh, anyway, to create some weaknesses, if White had played Rook of One and Queen E7, okay, but White plays forcing move G3, and we see now I think this 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 is a bit suspect for for Robert Zoltek, the human GM, to play F4 here. Um, so what what was he actually uh, thinking? Uh, what was the actual thinking actually? Let's try and comprehend here. What is the actual thinking with Black playing f4, and why was it punished so 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 easily? So White took, takes Rook takes, sorry Bishop takes f4, Rook takes f4. So in this position, White didn't mind g takes, and now Knight takes c4 was played, allowing this check. What what if what what was what why would black not think that white would play the check? Let's have a look. If King F seven 
queen e2 it just it just sets up a huge pin maybe you know you could argue that didn't black just blunder why did he go in for this f4 business when he could have played in this position bishop f6 and position is is okay for for white but he has created some weaknesses so why did black go completely mad playing like this so knight takes f4 then sacking the exchange maybe just he just fought those dynamic compensation but it seems that um after this move queen e2 th this is a bit of a killer move really this this might be it because black might be thinking that this wasn't a big deal but actually what the big deal is about this check is this pin on the rook on a8 this is the big deal that this position requires deeper investigation the sting at the end of the tail here is that there's a tactical vulnerability this pin on the rook um, and the problem with e6 as well that uh, makes this kind of uh, very tricky okay so the check was played and at the moment we've got e7 covered here we've got e6 covered here as well but this this pin it's this pin here which which is the real pain what does black do here black black looks busted here so so yeah this this whole conception with f4 was was tactically refuted in this game if we go back to f4 it was tactically refuted black should have played apparently just bishop f6 so okay again you might think blimey uh borislav's having a, a great tournament here uh why is everyone giving him a hard time about this tournament okay um but yeah i mean he's great then he's he's, he's crushing these like 2500 to 2600 gms let's have a look at another uh so round six Okay, now as black against uh, GM Z Zdenko two six three eight GM, which a lot of us, if we're like about twenty two hundred, would be slightly worried about playing uh, twenty six three eight GM. Uh, so what happened in this game? So let's have a look. Okay, so let's get past the opening phase. H four quite aggressive actually. Is that? Is that quite popular here to play h4 out of interest? h4 is one of the 24 games, usually white just castles. So h4, h6. Okay, queen c1. Okay, so black is discouraged from castling clearly, so he doesn't want to lose h6. Gain space in the center. It looks like a logical move, and it's the one played. Queen c7, again, okay, it looks logical. Black castles takes on b4. So white's playing the standard sort of plan in the English Open to gain space on the queen side. Okay, but the clever thing about black's play here is, if we look at earlier, this queen c7 is actually tactically quite deep. Uh, that potentially there, there's um, there's a pin going to be used if we fast forward now there's white's having to play c2 there's an x-ray on this queen which is now used in in this position with knight d5 and it's knight d5 which gives black that small advantage that we see now so it's quite good foresight uh the, the moves they all fit together from black and black is is getting an advantage here against a 2638 gm and statistically this this is really this really doesn't happen much uh, statistically for a 2200 player to be having such a fantastic tournament uh, by this stage and okay uh but anyway d d4 loses a pawn why why on earth did white play d4 you might think why is he losing c4 well what else does white play what is black actually threatening here black's actually threatening rook a2 now this pawn is a right pain uh, rook a2 and rook b2 and this pawn's even going to get onto the seventh rank and then we'll have rook a1 it'll be a total disaster so white shields that diagonal it's trying to loosen c3 so queen takes c4 and he's tactically relying on this pin knight d2 uh, to attack the queen but here queen c7 so black is um it seems uh well protecting the bishop as well 
so that was actually a double attack by the way so the queen goes back to defend the bishop and now white's idea is to get that c3 pawn which he does but black's still better and this this is quite interesting white's weakened uh, the squares around his king now just from an instructive game point of view you might think uh, this this doesn't look like such a big deal because hang on a sec um, you know this this bishop's biting on granite um, the interesting thing is how the king position uh, in less than 10 moves here is dismantled so have a look at this queen d5 uh, now I think is the threat b5 or rook a3 maybe this this part this past pawn is quite dangerous to consider as well as rook a3 okay so it's tied down a little bit bishop f8 now and the bishop is is preparing to sack itself on g3 now but first b5 in this position to protect the pawn with the queen and the knight is is having to defend sometimes a2 as well but it goes to d3 now uh, but there is this this lurking seventh rank pressure as well as this this sack in the air with bishop d6 now so the queen is is sitting quite mightily on that beautiful central square coordinating quite well with with the other pieces and after knight c5 we see you know what Tal or Alakine would be proud of playing here this next move uh, which is bishop takes g3 but white's king safety white is a 26 free 8 gm he's just been totally and utterly dismantled he's actually missed the threat or something or is the threat only after knight c5 the threat's not here it's when he's played knight c5 that there's a kind of weakness of the last move here which has been created um, why, why does it work so well here well let's see what happened bishop takes g3 fg and we see rook takes e3 well the knight was actually defending e3 now e3 dropping means g3 is under fire you might think well you can defend g3 you can't you can't defend g3 in this position well, it's, it's it's difficult uh, there's two ways well king h2 was chosen which just lost to queen f3 threatening rook e2 check and it was here that the gm resigned but in this position can you defend with say queen f2 ingeniously you might not be able to now this 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 i think i think we can safely say if this is the case this position being visualized then we have at least two moves okay which are raising eyebrows so far in all the games we've seen the first move a few games ago knight f5 but now this bishop g3 because it requires queen takes d4 uh to be seen in this position or is rook f3 that convincing no but queen takes d4 is not only attacking the knight but now threatening rook takes g3 so loads and loads of pawns here or, or winning the queen it looks as though or winning lots of material because if this knight stumbles back then we got a uh, check and if king of one we got queen d3 and white is falling to bits so that bishop takes g3 was an absolutely staggering move and maybe we can we can say I'll, i would say that's an eyebrow raising tactic in this position it really is tearing white's king safety apart as far as the outstanding the absolutely outstanding tactical moves that we might have seen uh, so far so this is against the 2638 that uh, he was just uh, completely crushed uh, like this and uh, this is all it's all pretty neat as well and you might think oh it's neat rerouting as well all this prelude to that um, so anyway let's let's go on to round seven now in round seven uh, Borislav uh, was playing another 2638 and drew with black so uh, that's um, put on Houdini 2.0 so Benoni which is sometimes thought of a little bit suspect because of that d6 weakness in particular but uh, okay 95 so simplification 
and um, Black's plan at the moment is sometimes to use the three to two pawn majority, and he seems to be playing this plan uh, quite well now. A six, okay. H six, interesting move. It's not it's not mentioned here at this depth. At this depth, now it now it is de de sixteen. It starts to be mentioned. Rook B eight. Okay, so B five. You might think that that's a bit curious because you might be be tempted for B six to try. You you might intuitively you might want pressure on on B three because White is not compelled to play on Poisson, so you might you might consider B six. Is there actually a problem with B six? White could take like this. Well, we White would still have the option in the game. Okay, and in fact. White didn't take the option. Maybe that that maybe that is the best move because now, I don't know. White White um, didn't want to play a takes b six. Played knight b one, so creating that pin. And apparently, technically, on on this depth, um, it's about equal. Uh, okay, just just for those interested, but how would you follow up after a takes b six? You're giving yourself this this target on B3 as white, which intuitively might not be the most pleasant thing to do. But if Black tried for C4, do you just play? What do you play here? E5. That looks dangerous. Yes, it could end up quite crushing. Uh, so you can't if you can't exploit B3 that easily. Okay, apparently this 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 was technically an interesting continuation. So anyway, m moving along, uh, Bishop G4, interesting move. Bishop G4, not Bishop H3. Intuitively, as as uh, Lilov has mentioned, you know, Bishop H3 might be the more intuitive move. Try and cause some weaknesses uh, around White's king. But Bishop G4 attacking a rook. Okay, and factoring in uh, must be factoring in E5 as a counter response here. If E5 here. We sorry, we just take the rook. We don't mind dropping f6 here. Okay, so the rook is uh, moving or something, or what is going on here? The rook moves. Bishop f3 now weakening like that, so that's more elegant than going to h3. So knight d2 taking off, weakening white's king a little bit. Now the move g5. Uh, so not minding e5, which might be a surprise because e5 looks looks as though it could be dangerous here. Um, but actually, e5 is harmless here because now we've got knight takes d5. With that bishop being removed, knight d5 is possible now, and this isn't such a big deal for white. So white didn't go for e5 here. White played rook f1. And then we see g4, which marks out h3. B4 is played, and you notice now that e5 is being kept under control by black. So it's a rather elegant play, which is which come together now, and this is a protected pass pawn as well, which White has to to watch over. So now it seems Black solved most of his problems against um, his twenty six three eight GM opponent. Queen D three, getting the queens off and using that that pin, making use of that pin. Uh, so simplifying D five is now weak, uh, but. Uh, no, he doesn't want to lose d6 or anything. He just takes on e4, takes on e5, getting rid of that Benoni classic weakness. Okay, and now um, after rook takes e5, we peacefully get a position where his 26 free 8 opponent has had enough of this guy, perhaps, and just accepts the draw because uh, black's even going to be better after king e8. This, this pawn's not going anywhere. It's being blockaded. Black's actually better. GM probably recognised that. If if anyone's better fractionally, it's going to be Black. Um, so he, he offered a draw. So he had enough. <laughs> so the Benoni, even with its um, fundamental weaknesses, was used here to draw with a two six three eight opponent. Um, so it's not the individual game. Which can be evidence for anyone cheating. It's the 
it's it's a large number of games which increase probability. It's just basic uh, research methods uh, which need to be uh, applied sometimes, uh, I guess. So um, as as white here in round eight, and apparently uh, because of the suspicions raised during the tournament, they took off the live relay, and we saw this rather limp. Uh, game from white against the 2600 now uh, so let's see where white just got um, not not such a hot position at all from the opening black's already doing well okay so g3 okay bishop e7 rook d1 okay Black has no problem pieces. Bishop's outside. <coughs> Pardon me. Pardon me. Bishop's outside the pawn chain. Queen's subject to harassment. There's nasty pins, maybe. So you might think this next move, well, coming up, is is just to get out of the X-ray uh, and the pins. The move Queen C4, just going into out of the frying pan into a fire with potential for B5. What should White play? Well, it shouldn't be bothered maybe about knight c5 here, just play e4 apparently. If knight c5, you can even, actually a good move is queen f1 here. Because we've got this uh, potential attack on the queen. But no, he, he didn't play that, so you might think, well, given the tactical skills of earlier rounds, why didn't he play e4? He played queen c4 instead, and this gives white the um, a problem because black stretching out on the queen side now gaining space uh, squeezing on on the queen side okay more pressure on d4 d4 looks as though that's a problem it's got to be reinforced uh, so okay bishop f4 so for the moment black's able to get a squeeze now going and still harass the queen and this diagonal is still dangerous this bishop still dangerous best move knight h4 you might think from previous rounds be keen to eliminate that bishop but he didn't create a3 allowing black to stretch now create a really more tangible advantage stretching out on the queen side squashing white and now bishop c2 bishop c2 gaining uh, more more space basically with pieces as well so c5 stretching out and black's pieces are all coming to life b4 might not actually be the most accurate actually knight d5 okay so he played b4 took now this looks like um, the weakest move of the tournament so far so this is round eight it looks like the weakest move of the tournament was played now by Borislav he plays the move knight e5 uh, not only is that kind of weakening uh, d4 but there's also potential pins being used here etc so black did take take now d4 is slightly more vulnerable so knight d7 now threatening knight takes e5 winning a piece uh, so white has to deal with that and d4 is really quite vulnerable as well but even worse this this is a prelude to a maneuver like this to really intensify the pressure on the queen side so knight b6 now so nasty pin on d4 nasty knight c4 but that's getting uh, a bigger advantage now queen e4 doesn't really help white either so white's gone off off the road here, um, and and the queen side now this taking on b2 this this big pass pawn now has emerged as well as winning that pawn, d4 dropping, black dominates the position, and is now threatening things like bishop f6 as well I think, as well as rook c2. Okay, so this this diagonal is really sensitive. So bishop e5 was played. We have. Queen d3 and now White resigned. So he got crushed in that game, and that was apparently when the relays were stopped. Um, and that raises some questions about relays in tournaments in general that should they be with a move delay or a time delay? I know some servers sometimes have a move delay, like five moves behind the main thing, or you could have a time delay, but then you still could be on one of the latest moves. So I don't know. Or And there's other questions being raised by this this whole thing this elephant in the room at the moment being reported by um chess base that um the the issue of security in general of, of devices and it's all getting high tech as though
blimey, what's happened? Chess meets Impossible Mission all of a sudden for, for over the board tournaments. Are people really going to have um, these high tech devices? Uh, so in in round nine, uh, again a two six two six GM opponents Sarek Ivan Sarek. So he's playing black against um, Ivan Sarek, and we get a razor sharp Sicilian defense. And as many of you know, you don't want to play in a sharp Sicilian defense if you're playing against computer, um, because horrible things happen. And in this game, some horrible things did indeed happen. Um, so let's get past the opening phase, which... Okay, in this position, if we do a reference check here, uh, H4 is actually the most popular move. 50 times it's been played before. G5 as well, 49 times. Taking on C6, 31 times. Girlfriend's played knight takes C6. And again, we saw H4. It's all like theory, I guess. So here again we're probably still in some sort of scan or no we think we've gone a little bit out one game here where bishop d3 was played cabrera against perpignan in 1997 okay so we're getting a little bit out of book now i suspect uh, at least on my little database so here f4 and it looks as though white's doing quite well with um with these impending pawns to smash up black's king. Uh, so we see b4, okay, trying to generate some counterplay, knight a5. Okay, and now this this is quite interesting, this move knight a5 actually. And you might think, why is it interesting? It's either a patsa move or it's a genius move the move knight a5 actually uh, because with the king on b1 knight a5 takes b3 is not check that's one thing to notice the other thing to notice is why it's control of the b6 square so tactically it seems initially as though knight a5 uh, is annoyingly refuted with knight b6 because knight takes a6 will attack the queen knight takes b6 runs into bishop takes b6 and because there's no check that's just losing material. So knight a5 really encourages a seemingly tactical refutation of uh, knight b6. But nevertheless, it is actually uh, what the engine really likes here is to play knight a5. And so we learn a new dynamic approach of way of handling this sort of position as black in the Sicilian defense where you've got this impending uh, destruction of your own king side and you're wanting to generate some counterplay and uh, the prelude seems to be this ingenious now exchange sacrifice because knight b6 taking on b3 and allowing positively allowing knight takes a8 getting an exchange sack for just one pawn now often we see exchange sacks for two pawns being quite convincing because they can often grow to three pawns but here it's for one pawn but the thing is about this position is it's a center pawn. This bishop's quite powerful on these two diagonals. And we've also got an undermining routine available to use uh, the A file to get at white's king. So all in all, the, the advantage for white, if there is one, is, is kind of minimal. And after rook h2, it seems to be mostly blown entirely at this depth. The engine kind of likes black, or at least equal, a5 seems uh, a good move to play a5 and it's not yet registering a5 but it seems entirely logical to play a5 d5 is the one at depth 18 I wonder if we're going to get into a5 here it comes up now a5 on depth 19 so we want to just peel open this a file as a human now if we exchange down um, so rook h2 was to do with perhaps defending c2 to free the queen uh, so we see a5 being played after however long it was. So now bishop d3 and black doesn't mind playing the exchange down here because now the queen okay goes to this is interesting as well it's not entirely um, maybe intuitive maybe to some of you to play queen b7 it does afford queen d5 um, 
What other threats are introduced? Queen d5 is the main positional one on b3 here. It's centralizing the queen quite nicely. There's also queen a6 as well for a4. Okay, so we see queen g2 and, and then queen a6 is now chosen for a4 to be supported. And all of a sudden you think, hold on a sec, black's attack here is really quick and these pawns are still miles away from doing any sort of actual breakthrough to expose anything. But white's king is being exposed just within two or three moves of here because of a4 on the cards. And you can't even play queen c2 to hold it up because of rook c8 kicking in the queen. Queen c2, rook c8, queen d2, rook a8 and black's still building up. So white plays d4 and he's getting now a bad in a bad way. A 26-2-6 is being hacked up here. Queen c2, the a file has been opened up, rook a8, now horrible threats are emerging like check and check. Rook c1. Uh, but here the king can run away. This this is not the best to play a check here. Best is something else which is, is played. Just calmly keeping that control here and going instead maybe to try it for this kind of knight maneuver to use the c4 square. d5 fixes the bishop behind its own pawn and now knight b6 taking it calmly. Rook c7, check. Now once the rook is over here this is more effective waiting for the rook to come to c7 um, is, is okay here for knight b6 because now this, this knight c4 seems pretty dangerous but hold on what is this what, what is this giving up e7 well it's to do with the check and the use of the c1 isn't it check or not no not queen c1 check here but the ultra clinical move queen f1 top move queen f1 interesting interesting how many of us would be tempted for other moves here queen f1 creates the huge threat of knight c4 check there's a mating that being well woven here knight c4 so sacrificing that bishop for this position oh dear white white's finding himself in a mating net from his 2227 opponent. Check. Oh dear, it looks absolutely brutal now. This check, uh, check, check. Taking the queen and white resigned here. He's, the only thing to worry about is, <laughs> is being back row mated, but queen c6 stops the back row and threatens now knight c4 mating. Um, it's pretty horrendous. He'll end up losing the rook. So he, he's resigned um, after losing his queen. I mean, gave up around about here. Um, let's just undo that to see. He gave up at rook takes a5. So absolute slaughter of a 2 6 2 6. Now, as I say, look, as I say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything 100%. I just think there were two very interesting moves, at least, that we've seen in the last few games. Uh, even if we don't count this one, to repeat, the knight f5 in an earlier game really astounded me. Uh, and then, for example, but um, and we saw some other interesting tactics along the way. This is this is round nine. Uh, is there any other anything else to look at? Um, no, we're back to round one. So you can get these games and have a look at them for yourself. There's a PGN available on the Chessbase site. And this, this is the tournament cross table. So this was the International Zada Open, December 16th to 22nd. Okay, so it was held in Zada, Croatia. Okay, so Open A was for players above 2300 FIDE. And Open B was for players under 2200. But players rated between 2200 and 2300 could choose the group in which they would prefer to compete. So this guy deliberately chose to play in this group with all the sharks and he proved himself to be more than capable. He got six points with a performance rating of 2697. Wow. And that was, <laughs> wow. It's, it's just incredible. It just really is incredible. I think there's another theory. This guy wasn't cheating um, 
he was just looking at my blitz games on the ICC and he learns a hell of a lot from looking at all the blitz games <laughs> it, it just wiped the floor of all these GMs okay that's an alternative theory comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much